Lovely. In which case, I will uh, introduce tonight's lecture and, and our speaker. So I'll, our lecture tonight is uh, Time for Dementia and Innovation in Dementia Education um, by Yvonne Feeney. Uh, so Yvonne is the project manager for Time for Dementia at BSMS and is also completing a PhD that aims to understand how empathy develops in healthcare students towards people with dementia. Yvonne is an adult nurse and has worked with people with dementia for most of her career. So with that, I will hand over to you, Yvonne. Thank you very much, Zach. And welcome, everybody. Um, and as Zach, I'm going to give a talk this evening about uh, dementia and about time for dementia. So I'm just going to share my screen. Well, this evening, what we do is we're going to start and we're going to do uh, just a little quiz. And we're just going to just look at some kind of basic questions around, um, uh, around dementia um, and just to see, you know, what you know, what you don't know. Um, and basically, all of those questions that we're going to ask, we'll cover the answers to that in the lecture this evening. We'll look at um, an overview of dementia. We'll talk about some of the risk factors around dementia. We'll talk about communicating with people with dementia. We'll look at then a dementia educational program that's running at Brighton and Sussex Medical School, and also some of the research that we've done in that um, program as well. And hopefully that will be of interest to everybody here. So the first thing we're going to do is a quiz. So answering true or false, dementia is a specific disease. Very good, most of you said uh, false, um, and that is correct. And we'll explain a bit more why that is later on. Next question. True or false? Dementia and Alzheimer's disease are the same thing. Very good. False? Yeah, most people think, think it's false and that's correct. Next question. Dementia is a normal part of aging. And most people have said false, that is correct. Dementia is not a normal part of aging. Next question. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. And we're almost there. There's almost a 50 50 split, but uh, it is the most common cause of dementia. Danielle, well done. People with dementia have trouble with short term memory. That is true. Well done. Memory loss is the only symptom of dementia. Well done, it is correct, false. Next question. Symptoms of dementia can include changes in mood and behaviour. Correct, well done. Two more questions. Dementia symptoms get worse over time. They do well done. Uh, it's a progressive disease. Dementia cannot be prevented. Yeah, uh, that is correct. Dementia cannot be prevented. And again, we'll talk more about that later. There's currently a cure for dementia. False, and that is correct. Well done. Excellent, your level of knowledge is 
pretty good. No, Sunday. Well done, well done, folks. Now let's we'll pack on with the um with our presentation. So just to give an overview about dementia, and here's some interesting statistics. So dementia affects 950,000 people in the UK today. Every three minutes in the UK, somebody develops dementia, and a new case of dementia arises globally every three seconds. Dementia doesn't just impact memory, but it can affect all areas of people's life. It's not a normal part of aging, and that was a question in the quiz, um, and it can affect younger people. Over 42,000 people in the UK um, have young onset dementia, and young onset dementia is classified as, as dementia that happens when you're under 65 years of age. By 2025, dementia is expected to rise. Over 1 million people will have dementia by that stage. And it can affect everyone, so including fa our own family members. And it's essential that we're all aware and have an understanding about dementia and what it is. So what dementia is. So dementia really is a term used to describe a range of symptoms that affect the brain. Symptoms of dementia include memory loss, confusion, difficulty communicating, um, difficulty problem solving and changes in behaviour, just to name a few um, uh, examples of, of the types of symptoms that affect the brain in, in dementia. Dementia is caused by um, uh, various different conditions and diseases, for example, Alzheimer's disease. And again, that was in the quiz. It's one of the most common causes of dementia. Dementia is progressive, which means it gets worse over time. There's over 200 different types of dementia, but the most common are Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, and some people then have mixed dementia. So they have a combination of, for instance, they may have Alzheimer's disease and vascular disease, which is quite common. So just to tell you a little bit about some of the mo those more common dementias. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia. It accounts for 60 to 70 percent of cases of dementia in the UK. It's called by, caused by a buildup of proteins, so amyloid, which causes plaques, and tau, which causes tangles in the brain cells. Um, and symptoms can include difficulty remembering recent events. Um, it, you can have challenges communicating. Uh, people have confusion, difficulty managers act managing acti activities of daily living, and also they can become disorientated to their, their environment. Alzheimer's disease can, can't be cured, um, but some medications are available that can help slow the progression of the disease. Then we have vascular disease, uh, uh, vascular dementia, and vascular dementia affects 15% of people with dementia currently. And it's caused by impaired blood flow that results to damage in the brain. And it's caused by um, diseases like uh, cardiovascular disease, um, which can result in strokes and bleeding in small vessels in the brain, for example. Um, and some of the symptoms of vascular dementia include memory problems, difficulty managing everyday functions and difficulty communicating. But symptoms can vary depending on what part of the brain is damaged. Again, it can't be cured, but treatment can be provided to help slow down uh, the dementia and manage some of those underlying symptoms, such as medication can be provided uh, to control blood pressure, for example. Um, it, it's advised to increase exercise to improve cardiovascular function um, and stopping smoking is another example to help kind of minimize those um, uh, side effects from or those, those causes of vascular dementia. Then we have Lewy bodies dementia. So dementia with Lewy bodies affects 10 to 15% of people with dementia. And it's caused by a buildup of proteins called Lewy bodies in the brain. Uh, Lewy bodies were discovered by Dr. Lewy in Germany, I believe. Uh, Lewy body dementia often affects areas of the brain's brain, which is responsible for sleep, alertness, and vis visual perception. Um, again, it can share similar symptoms to Alzheimer's uh, disease, but there's some there's some unique features to dementia with Lewy bodies, and this includes things like having difficulty with movement, disturbed sleep, um, hallucinations, and difficulty staying awake. Again, it can't be cured, but some medication is available that can help to manage the symptoms. For example, to help improve concentration, movement, and sleep. 
Um, Non-pharmacological interventions are really important as well. So thinking about interventions that maybe perhaps could aid relaxation and help people to sleep. Um, looking at dietary considerations. So for example, if people drink tea and coffee, maybe minimizing caffeine intake as the evening wears on, and that can help uh, people sleep a bit better. Um, uh, getting physiotherapy to help with movement and muscles. Um, and those kind of things are really important to help control uh, the symptoms. One of the rarer dementias is frontotemporal dementia, and this affects about 2% of people with dementia. Frontotemporal dementia affects the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain. It's caused by buildup of protein that damages brain cells again. There's two main types. There's behavior and behavior of variant frontotemporal dementia, and there's primary progressive aphasia. So behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia results in damage to the frontal lobes, and this impacts behavior and personality, which can lead to difficulty controlling emotions, planning, um, difficulty problem solving, and focusing on activities. And the, the, the area of the brain where this is really the front of uh, the front here um, at the forehead. Then primary progressive aphasia affects the temporal lobes, and that's back here by the ears. Um, and this area of the brain helps control language. Um, and if if this is affected, you can have difficulty finding words. Uh, you can lose your vocabulary. You can have difficulty with speech and forgetting the meaning of words as well. Frontotemporal dementia is more common in younger people than the other dementias, and it can happen in people between the ages of 45 and 65. Again, it can't be cured, and some medications can make frontotemporal dementia worse. They can make the symptoms worse. Um, so um, it, it requires real specialist um, intervention to manage the symptoms of frontotemporal dementia. Again, non-pharmacological interventions are incredibly um, important. So getting sufficient exercise, for example, being mindful of your diet um, and managing comfortable environments. So, for instance, that um, it's not too overstimulating that you have... Um, you know, that you can have peace and quiet and things like that. Um, so can we prevent dementia? Well, we can't prevent dementia, but there, we can certainly address some of the risk factors to help decrease our chances of getting dementia. There is non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors that influence dementia prevalent, prevalence, and we'll talk about those in a little more detail. So in terms of the non-modifiable type of risk factors, um, age, is one of the biggest risk factors um, for getting dementia. So as we get older, our risk of dementia increases. So um, one in six people over the age of 80 will develop a dementia and one in three people over the age of 90 will get dementia. Genetics. So uh, different genes can impact our risk of getting dementia. So again, if um, uh, there's some genes, you're, you're more likely to get dementia, whereas others, you're less likely. Um, so for instance, some of the risk genes, um, there's a gene called APO3 uh, or APO3, a A3, um, and that gene can influence, can increase your risk of getting dementia. But if you have that, you don't, you won't necessarily get it either. But it increases your risk. Gender. So women have a higher inc incidence of dementia than men, um, and some of the reasons for this may be the fact that women live longer, and as we said, with age, um, dementia prevalence increases. And ethnicity as well. So people from Black African, Black Caribbean and, and Asian groups may have a higher risk of getting dementia. And this may be, for instance, due to risk fa other risk factors. So they have a higher risk of getting diabetes and car cardiovascular disease, for example. Then looking at some of the risks that we can perhaps manage in our lives um, and this is really important to help reduce our um, risk of getting dementia. So um, Dame Robinson from the from Newcastle University is a professor in um, ageing. And uh, Dame Robinson has said healthy hearts, healthy bodies, healthy brains should be our mantra. And this is really important when we think of those risk factors that we can manage. So diet, for instance, we can eat a varied diet um, and include fruits, vegetables, and everything else just to ensure that we're getting good nutrition. Um, keep physically active to maintain a healthy heart. And this helps to reduce the risk of diabetes, stroke, and heart disease. Don't smoke, it's quite toxic. 
Um, alcohol, drink in moderation, or better yet, not at all. Um, socialize. So um, it's really important to take steps to prevent loneliness. Socialize with friends, get involved in group activities. And this is throughout life. So again, even as you as you're getting older, it's really important to maintain those relationships. Education. So keep your brain active. Um, larger cognitive reserve can help to reduce the risk of dementia or help to delay the start of symptoms. Um, full time education helps with that. Um, the longer you stay in school, um, the again, you have a slightly less uh, lower risk. Um, using a range of mental skills and work is really important. Learning a new language can help as well. And also protect your brain So protect your head from injury. Wear helmet cycling, um, wear helmet, helmets on scooters and things like that. Then if we look at caring for people with dementia. So as we said, dementia is progressive, meaning that people with dementia need support throughout their lives. Um, and as, as the disease progresses, they need more support. Um, but they can have difficulty managing day-to-day -day activities. They can have difficulty living independently. Um, people with dementia, as, as the dementia gets worse, they can have difficulty driving, cooking, um, washing, dressing. Uh, they can have difficulty with household tasks and managing financial matters, for example. In England, over half a million carers support people to live with dementia, and generally people live at home with dementia with, with their spouse or, or um, it could be uh, sons or daughters uh, that could be supporting the person. Being a carer can feel really rewarding, but there's also challenges involved. So there's changes, there may be changes in the role, um, and there quite often is. So the carer may now need to do some of the tasks that the person with dementia used to do. Carers can sometimes feel unsupported. There can be changes in relationships and they can feel frustrated at times um, in their caring role. And it's really important that carers are listened to and supported. Um, without carers, the NHS would collapse. They would not be able to support um, people with dementia going forward. Um, there's an incredible amount of, um, amount of carers in this country that, that care for people with dementia. Um, some of the resources that uh, can be used to support carers includes access to GPs, access to specialist healthcare professionals, um, carers groups, charity organisations and support from local authorities to organise carer assessments as well. Next, we'll talk about communicating with people with dementia. So as dementia progresses, uh, people can have difficulty communicating. They may need more time to process what has been said. They may have difficulty finding their words. They may forget what has been asked or they may have difficulty uh, concentrating on conversations. And sometimes this can feel really frustrating for both parties and it can leave other people. So it can leave people who don't have dementia. It can, make them, uh, it can leave them unsure about how to communicate with somebody with dementia. So here are some tips. And tips. So it's really important that if you're talking to or communicating with somebody with dementia, that you're in a comfortable environment. If there's excess noise like a radio or TV, ask for permission to turn it down or turn it off. Make sure you're in a comfortable space. Sit closely to the person, face them. Um, don't speak away from them. Uh, when you're thinking about verbal communication, sometimes it can be helpful to slow your pace. Um, use short, simple sentences if that's more if that's better for the person with dementia. Allow time for them to respond. Um, with dementia, it may take more time for them to process what has been said and to uh, formulate a response to that. Um, so it's really important to allow time for that. Be patient. Rephrase a question if it need if you need to if the person has difficulty understanding it. Um, maintain a conversation rather than asking a checklist of questions. Um, converse with the person. Think about body language, use open body language, listen carefully to what the person is saying, smile, use good eye contact and observe um, the person as well to make sure that they're not getting too tired. Because again, it can be really taxing um, when, you know, if they're trying to concentrate on something, um, uh, it can be really taxing again to formulate those responses. So you need to be observant of that and give people a break when they need that. Respect the person with dementia, treat them with respect and don't treat them like a child because they're not. 
Um, and also to help prompt uh, communication, you can use things like uh, photographs and you can talk about the person's life. So very often for people with dementia, they can sometimes remember, they can often remember things that happened a long time ago, but they may not necessarily remember, um, they may have more difficulty with their short term memory. So what happened you know, immediately in the last five, five or 10 minutes, for instance, but they will remember things from many years ago. So you can sometimes talk about those kind of things and also talk about common interests. So again, if it's um, a grandson may like to play golf, for instance, and, and a grandfather or grandmother may have enjoyed golf, and that's something to talk about together. Now, just move on to the next uh, slide. And I have a video, so I'm just going to play this. You may hear people use lots of different words for dementia. What they mean is that how a person thinks and how their brain works is changing. To think, the brain uses electrical signals like a computer. With dementia, some of those signals get lost along the way. What you might see on the outside is that a person starts to forget things or say or do things that seem a bit clumsy or odd. They might need more time to do things like getting dressed eating or even getting their words out. When someone you care about has dementia, one thing it means is that while we can do things to make them feel happier, their condition won't improve. And the way their brain works will keep on changing over time. So it's natural for you and the adults around you to feel a bit worried or sad. Don't keep it a secret. Talk to an adult you trust. You might find you were worried about something that wasn't even true. For example, dementia isn't like chicken pox. You can't catch it from someone else. And just because someone in your family has it, doesn't mean it's going to happen to you. Most of the time, while the way you talk and play together will probably change, they aren't going to stop caring about you. And there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to have fun and spend quality time together. Often for someone with dementia, feelings and emotions are more important than words and ideas. They're happiest when they're comfortable and doing things they enjoy, like spending time with you. So think about the things they like to do. Listening to music, looking through photos, perhaps you could try a simple version of an old hobby, or if they used to read to you, you could read to them instead. Whatever you decide to do together, you and your family probably know more about what makes them happy than anyone else. But even with experts on the case, no one is happy all the time. And there will be days when they just need some personal space. Even if they are a bit grumpy or can't remember your name, it doesn't mean that they have forgotten who you are. It's healthy to laugh at ourselves when we make mistakes. So taking things lightly can help. Try to be as kind and forgiving as you can. Let them know who you are and what it is you are doing. Be gentle with them and reassuring. Sometimes something as simple as a hug can make all the difference. Love is a strong and powerful feeling that goes through your whole body. It's more than just an idea. It was there long before dementia came along. And it's not going anywhere now. That's a video by Dementia UK and they have some amazing resources um, that I would encourage you all to have a look at um, about dementia. So we'll move on to our next slide. I have planned to ask for a show of hands, but unfortunately I can't see you. So I'm going to uh, call out some statements and just have a think about this um, for yourselves. So the first one, or the first question I was really interested to know is, uh, how many of you would like to work in healthcare? And then I wanted to know how many of you think you would work with people with dementia in healthcare? And very often when we talk to people that are interested in working in healthcare, so future um, dentists, but doctors, nurses, um, they'll tell us, you know, I want to work in surgery or I want to work um, 
uh, in, you know, with people with cancer, for example, but not necessarily with people with dementia. However, the likelihood is that you will uh, work with people with dementia at some point. Currently, one quarter of hospital admissions are for people with dementia. Most healthcare students will work with people with dementia during their career um, in, in some respect. Generally, people don't come into hospital solely for dementia. It's often for something else. So it's, it's a broken leg. It's to manage diabetes. It's, uh, it's something else. It's not necessarily uh, dementia. Um, however, people with dementia do report poor experiences in hospital. So it's really, really important that healthcare students have the right attitudes, knowledge and understanding to provide high quality care to people with dementia. And part of that is through really good education um, when they're training to become a doctor, a nurse, a dentist, a pharmacist, etc. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Time for Dementia programme. Um, the Time for Dementia programme was developed at Brighton and Sussex Medical School in 2015, and it's a longitudinal dementia educational programme. And it's, it's been designed to enhance awareness, positive attitudes and knowledge in undergraduate healthcare students um, towards dementia and really to create a skilled workforce for tomorrow. And basically what happens is peers of students go out to visit a family who are living with dementia three times a year over the course of two years. And what happens is the students learn through the lived experiences of the families. So the person with dementia and the carer will tell the students what it's really like to live with dementia. What are the struggles? What helps them to live well? And um, those type of things. And it's by spending time with that one family, those students can get better insight about dementia and something that they can't really get in, in the hospital when they briefly meet a patient for a short period of time. Here in Time for Dementia, they build relationships and they get to know that family. And we're now in our 10th year um, of running Time for Dementia at BSMS. The programme itself has been funded by Health Education England, and this has helped us to be able to roll the programme out to new universities since we originally implemented it at, at BSMS. So um, since 2015, the programme has now um, been introduced at University of Brighton, University of Surrey, University of Greenwich, Canterbury Christchurch, Kent and Medway, uh, Medical School, University of Exeter, University of Plymouth. And later on this year, we're going to um, implement the programme at Southampton Medical School, University of Chichester and the University of West of England. So if anybody plans to go to those and um, train as a doctor or a nurse, um, for example, um, you would take part in Time for Dementia. Currently, we've had over six and a half thousand students take part in the programme and over 2000 families have supported those uh, students to take part. Um, we work with Alzheimer's Society and Alzheimer's Society recruit the families and they support the families during the programme. So Time for Dementia is quite a different way of learning about dementia. So traditionally, um, when you when you complete your healthcare training, you will normally do blocks of theory at university and you spend blocks of time in clinical practice settings. Um, but generally, you don't go to visit um one family and spend lots of time with them. And that's why Time for Dementia is quite different. You see the same family over the course of two years. So it was really important that we actually understood and, and were able to evaluate um, learning outcomes in students. So specifically what we wanted to do is we wanted to understand the learning outcomes and changes in attitudes, understanding and knowledge of dementia and students who took part. We wanted to know how satisfied students were in taking part and their experiences. We were really interested to evaluate the satisfaction and experiences of the families taking part as well, because without the families, we don't have a programme. They're really important. They're our teachers. To do that, to, to carry out this research um, with students, we used questionnaires to measure their knowledge, their attitudes and their empathy towards dementia. And we did that before they started the programme and then after they finished the programme. And what we did was we compared those scores against students who didn't take part in time for dementia. We included uh, nursing, medical, paramedic and an allied healthcare professional students from six universities in this piece of research. And we also completed interviews and focus groups with students, with a, a bunch of students to get 
real in-depth understanding about how the programme worked for them, um, how they learned um, and uh, what was good, what was bad about the programmes, that sort of thing. We couldn't get those, we couldn't get that real in-depth understanding through the use of questionnaires alone. So that's why we completed interviews and focus groups. With the families who were taking part, um, we asked people with dementia and their carers to complete a satisfaction survey. And we also completed interviews with them as well. Very same as, as what we did with the students. And it was to get real insight to their experience of taking part in the programme. So I'll just tell you about some of these findings in a moment. But first, I'm going to um, give you some examples of some of the questions or the questionnaires that we provide to students to measure knowledge, attitudes and empathy. So when we tested students' knowledge, here are some of the questions. So for example, um, this was a true and true or false questionnaire, and it was um, there was a whole series of questions in this. So for example, having high blood pressure may increase a person's risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. True or false? Think about the the things that we've covered already. What do you think? Um, genes can only partially account for the development of Alzheimer's disease. So that so that was a true or false questionnaire. And then we also had a questionnaire that had multiple responses. So drug treatment available through the NHS for Alzheimer's disease can stop symptoms from getting worse, um, only works during the early stages of the condition, or can slow down cognitive decline and improve functioning for a period of time, and so on. And, and you just choose the, the response that you think is correct. Measure attitudes and empathy. Again, this was done using a series of questionnaires. And again, here's a selection of uh, questions. So for instance, it is, it is rewarding to work with people with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Um, it is important for people with dementia to be given as much choice as possible in their daily lives. Um, I believe that emotion has no place in the treatment of medical illness. Um, and empathy is a therapeutic skill without which a healthcare provider's success is limited. And basically with these questionnaires, we asked on a scale um, students to agree. So you strongly disagree or strongly agreed and where uh, you, you would answer that on a scale. So, um, when we looked at student scores in these questionnaires, we compared students who took part in time for dementia versus students who didn't. And what we found is students who took part in time for dementia had higher knowledge of dementia when they finished the program. And they had uh, more positive attitudes towards dementia when they finished the program. However, there was no difference in empathy between the groups. And you heard Zach mentioned earlier on, Part of my PhD is looking at how empathy develops, and this is something that I'm also looking at, at about um, uh, how empathy develops towards people with dementia when, when, um, when they're training. In terms of the interviews, so to understand more fully what students learned from um, their experiences with the families, we asked them to, to share those experiences with us. So we did 39 interviews and we did five focus groups with 38 students. And um, we had medical, nursing and paramedic students take part in this piece of work. Um, and when we examined the findings, uh, we created a series of themes that were common in uh, everything that the students had said. We found that, that there was four um, uh, common themes around what they had learned from taking part. So students first talk, spoke about the benefits of this real life learning. So they described it as relational learning. So benefits, real life learning, going out to see the family. And they said it made dementia more visible. They were really able to see what it was like to live with dementia. The relationships that they had with the family helped them to be able to ask some of the some questions that were perhaps um a little bit more sensitive that would be harder to ask uh, to somebody if they briefly met them. But when they met the families over the course of two years, that relationship meant that they could ask some of the harder questions. They said the programme gave them a bit more insight and understanding about the lived experiences of dementia. They had a better awareness of the feelings of dementia. Um, and also they, they could understand the impact of dementia on the carer. As I'm talking, it might be really helpful to um, read some of the quotes on the on the right hand side. And that's what students told us about their experiences. And those are really interesting. They spoke about um, being able to challenge attitudes and stigma. So by getting to know the families and under, getting a better understanding of dementia, um, they could 
essentially see beyond some of the negative stereotypes that they may have held at the beginning of the program. They realized that people with dementia could still live really well at home once they had the right support and that there was still joy in life, that that life didn't end um, once per a person got a diagnosis of dementia. And they spoke about enhanced dementia practice. So by going out to visit the family, they gained better communication skills, they had a better understanding of the importance for person-centred care and seeing the person, not just the condition in the hospital setting. And they spoke about the importance of understanding a person's life. So there's um, things that they could use in the hospital setting to understand a person with dementia, such as a hospital passport where a person with dementia may fill up their likes and dislikes and things that are important to them in, in their life. And students felt that these were really, really important um, to improve the care that they delivered in the future. I'm just going to play a video of a student, of some students actually talking about their experiences. So I was having a little look around to find this and it's the book that I took with me to my visits. And I just jotted down a couple of things um, and it was actually quite nice to, because I've just found it today, I was having a rummage and it was nice to have a little flick through of actually. It brought back quite a lot of memories of the family. Yeah, it's lovely to read through it again. It was incredible that they would let us into our, their home and talk about something that might be quite difficult to talk about with strangers that they've only just met. And um, it was a great experience. I enjoyed it a lot. The family that I got to see were a husband and wife, and the husband was the um, person with dementia. He had a mixed Alzheimer's and vascular dementia, and the wife was the main carer. Um, and we were actually really lucky because we got to see um, the family within three or four weeks of the diagnosis. So of, over the three years we got to follow them on their journey from like the start um, to when we finally um, said goodbye to them. And I think that was really interesting um, because we got to see how um, rampant um, or how everyone responded um, to the diagnosis, especially the carer because we asked her, oh, what would you like us to say to people about dementia? And she said that the care is with them all the time and we do struggle. Um, and that still stays with me today, I think, because even when I see patients that don't have dementia, I'll try and like, oh, hang on, how's this going to influence like, the patient's family, not just the patient? Um, the lady I was with at the family, she, she quite liked poetry. And she, she wrote um, a poem about kind of her experience of, I guess, becoming a carer, if you, if you want to use that word. And I wrote the first line of it because it, it stuck with me. Um, Today I lost a part of you, a part of you that was here yesterday. And that was the first visit. I forgot that was at the first visit. And I think that kind of shows you how they let us in. And that poem obviously was very personal. So I forgot, I forgot that was at the first visit, actually. So when I first got the details about the family I was due to visit, my first impression was surprise at how much experience they had, both personally and professionally, with dementia. Um, so one had previously acted as a care worker for dementia before retiring, and the other individual had also previously cared for someone with dementia. So they had a really significant amount of experience, which can be quite intimidating, I suppose, when, when you feel that you've got so little at the time. I didn't know much about dementia when I started, but I absolutely did by the time it had finished because my family, not only did we have great conversations, but they gave me a file of patient information leaflets, uh, information about the condition, advocacy groups, everything, and just handed me this file and let me borrow it for several months. So it sort of worked quite nicely to link that sort of personal element of dementia with the healthcare area of dementia and how those two can overlap and how you can sort of help each other in that situation. I'd seen people in acute hospital settings where they, you just see that person there and at that time and space when they're unwell, but 
Going into the dementia family, I really learned such a lot that actually this lady had a huge history that I knew nothing about. And I was learning about that as I went. And it, I think it's been really valuable to me to know that, yes, when I go on to my career in a hospital, that when I'm caring for someone with dementia, that I've got to remember that that person's got this big life behind them probably a really interesting one and it's worth getting to know. I would definitely say to a new cohort of student nurses that were taking part in the programme, take a minute, okay, and although it might seem overwhelming and a bit kind of, why do I need to do this, how is that going to benefit me, just take a step back because actually, you know, this is really, really fruitful for your future because Although you're going to be working predominantly in an acute setting as your first post as a newly qualified nurse, this is giving you exposure to the outside and into the community where people actually live. So you can then compare acute hospital setting with what they're likely to be doing at home. Whether that be positive or negative, that will then help direct you when you're coming to discharge your patient from acute care. What struck me was he wasn't angry at all with the diagnosis. I mean he had he said he had been in the past and sometimes it been quite it had been quite tough on him and his partner. But um, he said that over the years they slowly kind of adapted and it was just it, it didn't he said it doesn't it doesn't define me. I remember that it doesn't define me. It's it's just something I have. It, I'm still me, kind of thing. And that was, that was a nice moment, actually. I think you learn a different level of respect for people. In a, in a, it sounds very strange, but you, because you are so involved and you appreciate more and more the position they're coming from, I think you start to really admire them and really admire what, what they're up against on a daily basis um, and uh, those challenges they have to encounter day in and day out. So I think it does change the way you view patients as a whole because I think it's quite easy to forget just what's going on outside of the hospital but actually how important that is on someone's health and in fact the health of a whole family. I always remember leaving visits feeling just happier. It was just, it was just a nice, it was a nice environment. And again, it was, even though I suppose the reason of this is a learning opportunity as well, but it was also kind of good for the soul in a way. I will always remember them. I will always remember our family that we visited. Because I'm going to stop that there, but um, you'll be able to watch the end of the video on once it is published online. Um, they were so just very quickly to move on and just let you know a little bit about the family's experiences taking part so i'll just cover that very quickly and then we can get on to some questions so again we interviewed some families who took part um and asked them what was enjoyable about the program um what were their thoughts and again they said four different things but they said they were really motivated to join the program. They wanted to raise awareness of dementia and they wanted to give something back to society. They said it was really valuable. They were able to make a difference. They really enjoyed the program um, and they felt that carers felt really listened to. Um, so students were interested in carer's story and the person with dementia and this was valuable. They felt uh, student learning was incredibly valuable. They spoke about um, that they believed that their input would improve student understanding of dementia and improve um, what it looks like in hospital going forward for people like them. They said they valued the feedback and learning that students provided to them about their experiences. And finally, they spoke about the relationship. They spoke about really positive relationships uh, with the students. They really enjoyed their visits and the relationship built over time. And they could see students grow and gain confidence. Um, and that was something that was really positive. Um, overall, there was very high satisfaction for carers who took part. So 415 carers completed a satisfaction survey and they all felt it was very valuable. They were able to contribute towards student education. Um, and they enjoyed talking to the students. 
and we had a similar picture for people with dementia. 122 people with dementia completed a, a survey and said the same thing. There was very high satisfaction um, in their experiences taking part. There's an additional video that you might want to check out once the once this presentation is uploaded, and it's about a family talking about their experiences. Um, so do have a look at that. And I'm just going to move on. Um, and just to, to summarise about Time for Dementia itself, we can see that from the research that we've completed, that there was really good evidence that there was higher levels of um, uh, knowledge and better attitudes towards dementia and students who took part in the programme. Students were really quite satisfied with the programme. There was good feedback. They learned directly from families about their experiences of living with dementia. Um, and they felt that this was really important for their learning going forward. And in terms of the families, um, again, there was very high satisfaction for families taking part in the programme. And they felt it was really important that the voice of the person with dementia and the carer was involved in the education of these students going forward. And now over to yourselves with any questions and, the, and there's some resources at the end. So again, once this is uploaded by Zach, there's some fantastic resources there. Have a look at them um, and they cover everything that I've spoken about today. So somebody's asked, what kinds of medications can make FTD worse? Oh, lots of different kinds of medications. But um, to be honest, I am not a pharmacist or a doctor. And I think that's probably something to have a look, um, you know, have further reading yourself. There's some really good, as I said, really good resources out there. But in terms of any medications that are provided, you have to be really careful. So there's there's been there was a big report done back in 2009 about the use of antipsychotics, for instance, and this can make um, this can make things worse for people with dementia. For instance, it can increase confusion. Um, but there's lots of resources out there. Have a look and have a read. Excellent. We've got another one come through here. Um, how old do you have to be for the programme? Um, so to take part in Time for Dementia, um, you need to be studying um, an under so a health uh, healthcare course in a university that Time for Dementia is running on. So, um, so for instance, at Brighton and Sussex Medical School, um, in the medical degree program, uh, Time for Dementia is part of that module. It's a module within um, the curriculum. So um, it, that is generally then when you when you finish school and you apply for um, further education. So 18, I guess normally excellent uh, we've had a couple of questions here that sort of um are, are very similar in terms of what they're asking so i'll sort of sum yeah. them up in, in one um so firstly uh do you have any experiences that made you interested in dementia and secondly do you have any uh, do you have lots of personal experience with people with dementia oh that's interesting um so very interesting question so in terms of family experience, I don't have a lot of family experience with somebody with dementia, but where my interest in dementia came um, is from my nursing background. So I qualified as a nurse many years ago, um, back in about 2003. And when I qualified, um, I worked in, I was really interested in working in places like accident and emergency and surgery and things like that. And I didn't really want to work with people with dementia. And again, wasn't particularly um, aware that I would meet people with dementia in, in every part of, of a hospital setting. Um, however, what happened is um, as my career progressed, I started to work in the care home sector. And there I got a much bigger, um, I got much better insight, I guess, into dementia and the importance of actually spending time with people with dementia and hearing their stories and listening to them um, and spending time with them. Um, and that's what really interested me in Time for Dementia. And I didn't have Time for Dementia in my, when I trained, we just didn't have that type of training. And I thought it was so valuable um, that that's what made me actually apply to be part of the Time for Dementia programme and to be part of that team, because I think it's essential and I think it'll make a huge difference um, for people like yourselves that will end up training as our future doctors, our future nurses, our future dentists, pharmacists, radiographers and so on. And it's so important. It's so important that we spend time with the person with dementia to really get to know them. They're not 
they're not just their disease. They're not just their broken leg and bed three. They're a, they're a person and we need to see that. And that's so important. I hope that answered that question. Yeah, no, that excellent. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Um, so we've got another uh, good one here. It sort of touches upon what you've, what you've just said there. Um, so would you recommend working at care homes to get experience with people with dementia? Definitely, definitely. Um, I worked so... I worked in the care home setting for eight years and I loved it. And it's an incredible place. It's an incredible place to learn. So you learn really important skills in healthcare, but you really, um, again, you get time to actually really get to know a person. And because they're living in the care home setting, you get to know them over a long period of time. So again, you get to know their their history, their life, their family, um, what made them them. Um, and it's, it's a really, it's a great place to work. And, and, Again, you you learn, you work with um, with a team and various different people with lots of different qualifications. So there's there's tons of stuff to learn from people. So you'll have nurses there. You'll have healthcare workers that have worked with people with dementia for so many years that will have loads of experience to share with you. So definitely, I, I would absolutely recommend it. Excellent. We've, we're getting quite a few questions come through, so I'll do my best to, to answer as many, uh, ask as many of them as possible. Um, so this is a really good one that's just come through. Realistically, given NHS staff shortages, will healthcare professionals be able to make the time with patients that is needed to build these kind of relationships? It's really challenging. I think I think what the important thing is, so, so not necessarily that, you know, they... There will there'll never be the opportunity to really get to know somebody the way you'll get to know. So the way the students will get to know people on time for dementia, they spend um, an hour to two hours with one family three times a year over the course of two years. You won't really get a chance to do that within the NHS. However, what's the, the takeaway message from that is actually building the skills to get to know people, to recognize the importance of actually spending time, no matter how short that time is, even if it's three minutes, but making that three minutes count, not just, um, you know, waltzing past to whip on a blood pressure cuff and waltzing away. It's actually making time count. Um, and I think that's what's important. Um, and that's what's important with Time for Dementia is it helps, it helps to build that picture, I think, in people's heads. You see past the hospital walls, you realise that this person in the bed has a life at home. They have loved ones. Um, they can live well. They have challenges but with supports. They can, you know, they can, help, they can manage those. Um, and it's all of those. It's building that picture. Brilliant. So, uh, yeah, a couple of really uh, good ones here. So um, do the people in the program form emotional connections with dementia patients? And uh, is it is it hard to leave them um, after all those years? Um, and sort of, I suppose, linked in with that, what kind of activities uh, did the students do on their placements and, and how long were those? Yep. So um, so in terms of the first question around emotional bonds, yeah, absolutely. They, you know, they they see these families for um, over the course of two years. They absolutely do get close with families. Um, however, it's something, you know, they we prepare them before they go out for the visit. So they, they spend a, a half day with us going through the practicalities of time for dementia to really get ready. Um, to visit families and part of that includes you know talking about these emotional um, the emotional aspects of visiting a person and spending lots of time with them so they you know they're aware after the course of two years you know they leave the family they don't maintain contact that is not expected it's not um, that's that's not they're not expected to do that and they shouldn't do that um, and the families are supported by Alzheimer's Society and again the um Alzheimer's Society prepare the families for this as well. They understand that at the end of the program, that's it. You know, it it finishes. Um, in terms of supporting students emotionally and families emotionally, there's a whole there's a team of us there that support um the students. So again, if if students feel that that something is a bit more emotional than they would like, again, we are there to support them. Or there's different um, there's different avenues at the university as well that that are that's there to support the students. So that's the emotional side of things. And the second question, the second part of that question was uh, so, so what what sort of activities do they yeah. do they do? 
So um, again, with the so with the program, it can we have a structure for each visit. For, so for all six visits, there's a structure for the learning um, for, for student learning. So, for example, in the first visit, it's all about getting to know you, who you know, who you are, who we are. Um, a little bit about uh, where students can talk about the process of diagnosis, uh, what led the family to get a diagnosis, that sort of thing. Now, students don't necessarily have to follow that structure, but it's there to support their learning if that's something they feel they need. Um, again, for visit two, it might be all about communication, for example, and that visit structure will discuss various different topics and questions around communication. Um, the other things that we suggest for students to do are things like doing a life history together. So again, with the family, um, so talking about, again, likes and dislikes. So what I was talking about earlier about a research passport, um, that's that's one of the activities that we suggest that students do with the families. And it really helps um, them to get to know the family. And again, after that, it's really about communication and they direct the learning themselves. So the, the family and the students direct that learning together as a group, but we don't really tell them what to do. So that, that's for them to work out together. Excellent. I think this might have to be our last question uh, as we are running out of time. And it's it's a good one for sort of, um, you know, dispelling myths, et cetera, around, around dementia. So this person said, I was told by someone who's worked at a care home that dementia patients can get physically harmful to others. Um, is that true? Yeah, um, so people with dementia can get distressed, just like people with dementia, uh, like people who don't have dementia, for instance. Um, very often, if somebody with dementia is feeling distressed or is um, is becoming aggressive, for instance, it very often is related to um, an unmet need. So something that you know that they that they need support with that perhaps they're unable to express. Um, you know, they may be experiencing pain, for example. And again, so in in the care home setting, uh, one of the things that we felt was really important again was really knowing the the um uh, the resident and again really knowing their history so for example it may be somebody it could be a gentleman who might get up at five o'clock in the morning um and you know a, a appear distressed but actually when you when you understand that gentleman you understand that his background was he was a farmer that's what time he used to get up and he used to get up to you know milk cows for example so it's it's how you go about supporting that um and um, yeah, and part of that is is really knowing the person um, and uh, supporting them to manage those unmet needs that they have. Excellent. Thank you so much, Yvonne, for um, your, your presentation, but also answering all those questions. And, th and thank you all uh, for your, your excellent questions this evening as well. Um, lovely. So all that is left to say um, for, for this evening is thank you once again uh, to Yvonne Feeney um, for, for your lecture this evening. Um, thank you all for, for coming along uh, this evening as well. Um,